So as I mentioned, we're gonna do things a little differently this morning, and the presentation this morning is about looking back and looking forward. And to that, I'm going to add another layer, uh, kind of it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it is, uh, an exciting time to be here, but it's also a really challenging time to be here. So what are we thinking about this year? First of all, our new building. And for those of you who were here all summer, it just seemed like a lot of dirt and a lot of dirt and a lot of dirt, and all of a sudden, it's a building and the concrete is there and the steel is going up and we have our very own crane that people are talking about. And uh, next year, when we have this celebration and welcome back, we'll be over there. So we're on schedule, we're on budget. It's really exciting. We're getting ready to order the furniture. And, and of course, it's also challenging because we have to stay on schedule and stay on budget and um, get Crystal to give us a somewhat reasonable list of all the technology that she wants in the simulation lab. Um, and we also are out raising money to support all that specialized equipment and some other things for the building as, as, as well as scholarship endowment and technology. So it's exciting and it's challenging. Middle states. You're all wondering, how am I going to make this exciting? Uh, well, for me, what's exciting about this process are the people, the people who have taken on leadership roles to ensure that we do the very best job that we can in our self-study. There are so many people who've been involved, so I just want to mention the names of the steering committee, starting with John Haas and Chandra Galati Giruti, um, who took over in the middle, and, and she's been extraordinary. They both have. Uh, the other day, I was showing some guests around campus, and they are particularly interested in our relationship with Suzhou China, and I said, well, I'm going to take you uh, to a special room in the Learning Resource Center that we call the China Room, and it's filled with artifacts and books and hangings, and I get there, and John and Chandra and David Harper are in the room. There's nothing about China. It is filled with pink and yellow and chartreuse stickies for every different chapter. And I understand they are calling it the war room. And if you're wondering what the three of them did on their summer vacation, it was starting to create out of 14 disparate chapters, one coherent document, and they are doing a great job. And I also want to mention Maureen Conlon, Deb Uri, Larry Hearn, Karen Smith, Kathy Petrochenko, Ann Ryan, Crystal Farina, Cynthia France, Melina Baer, Juliette Smith, Courtney Sykes, Jen Hawley, Elaine Wilson, staff support from Jane Thomas and Latalia Stewart, and uh, research support from Chris Hall, as well as all the committee members. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you've put in. And there is one more exciting thing about Middle States. It's almost done. So. <laughs> But, but what's, before I move on to new faculty and staff, what's challenging about middle states? Well, the amount of work, but also achieving a balance. This is an honest reflection of who we are and who we want to be. But it's not a time to beat ourselves up. It's a time to think about how we could be better. It's also a time to praise ourselves, to pat ourselves on the back and to put our best foot forward and say to the team and the readers, um, we're a great college and we deserve to be praised and we will work on all the things that need to be worked on. So achieving that balance is really a challenge. The draft, there will be a draft ready for the team chair who's visiting in early November. And then shortly after, we will mail that baby off uh, and pay a hefty fee. And then we will have a team of, I think, about eight people come in March, and we'll get to plan a big dinner for, we hope, almost everybody on campus, and then three days of pretty intensive questions and answers and examination and with a decision in June. It's a big moment in the life of a college. So new faculty and staff, we just met a lot of them. What's exciting about that is, uh, the same thing that's challenging about it, they're going to ask us questions like, why do you do it that way? 
and they're coming with new ideas and they might be a little upsetting to us. Uh, but I know when I came, I asked those kinds of questions and, and it's easy after you've been here a while to stop asking and it's good to have some new people to come in and remind you that we are an institution that helps students change their lives and therefore we have to be open to change, but it's scary. So it's exciting to see all these new faces. It's also challenging. It's a little bit scary. Here's what I think we need to focus on in the coming year. We need to be mission driven. You probably can't read that. It's our vision and our mission. And our vision is to harness the talent and resources that we have to make this the best place it can be. One thing I can assure you is we will never have enough resources but we will always have enough talent. So if we work together creatively, we can make things happen. Our mission has to do with putting students first and transforming the learning experience. So together, that's what we need to focus on. And in particular, to constantly remind ourselves we are here for our students, students who come here for traditional credit programs, students who come here for training, students who come here for recreational and avocational or theater experiences, that's why we're here. And the second thing we need to do this year is to be action oriented. We need to focus on getting things done, on solutions, and sometimes what that means is not being afraid to be wrong. Because if we need to get things done, we might try something and it might not work, and then we'll figure out why and we'll try something else. And finally, of course, it means we have to work together. And you will hear from the vice presidents and from Michael about ways in which we have to work across divisions because enrollment management, the iPad project, they don't happen because one division assumes responsibility. If we want to grow enrollment, academic affairs need to think of what are the right programs. Lucy and her division, they need to market those programs. Student services, student success, they, they need to advise students into those programs. They need to make sure their degree audits are correct. It doesn't happen with, with one office. It happens with everyone across the campus. And not only within the campus or across the campus, but outside. How do we work with local businesses? How do we work with local school systems? Uh, some of that is mandated by law with the SB 740 and how we work with the new regulations regarding dual enrollment. But some of it is just an inherent part of our mission. We all live and work in these communities. So in many ways, it's, it's part of who we are as well as part of the college. So I think we've got our work cut out for us. And uh, now we have another exciting and challenging opportunity, and that is I'm gonna stop talking. And uh, each vice president and dean will get up and say a few words about his or her division. And what's challenging about that is each of these people has a unique personality you will see that shortly. And uh, the other challenge is that I've probably said some of the things they were planning to say and I have taken up some of their time and I am still challenging them to get done. So we're trying it a new way and you will be the judge and there's always next year if we wanna try something new. Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm exciting or challenging or none of the above. Again, I'm Tim Jones, Vice President for Administrative Services. One of the things uh, that each of us is doing within our divisions is we're looking at our, the strategic plan and then boiling that down for us. That's our document that we're using to drive what we do every day. From that, the Administrative Services Division has developed its Administrative Services Operating Plan, affectionately called ASOP, which Doug reminded me last week is also uh, Got some fables associated with it. Uh, this isn't fables, <laughs> but we do, use this <laughs> we do use this document really to drive across our division, which is pretty far reaching um, since we cover financial, human resources, security, auxiliary services like the bookstore and the, and the cafeteria, as well as the TPAC. Um, again, what we've done is we've defined goals in each of those across the division, but also tied back to the strategic plan so that we're meeting our mission for our students. 
Okay. Looking at last year, first thing we did, we want to talk about some of those successes. Uh, the first thing we did is we undertook our college-wide compensation study. We're still working on that. Uh, we actually will be presenting our recommendations to the board in a couple weeks. So after we um, do that, get approval from the board to proceed, we will be coming out with an implementation plan and then rolling that out this year. Uh, we've transitioned this past year, hopefully seamlessly, from being fully insured to self-insured. Why did we do that? Quite honestly, to save resources. We were able to do this, reduce costs, our second largest cost for the college, that we can now take that money and put it back into at things for the students. Um, we, I've heard no complaints. I think our HR staff did a fantastic job with that and should be congratulated. Uh, we budgeted and received for the first time in five years an increase in funding from the counties. A trend, and that's a trend we want to continue. Uh, we focused some on the Cambridge Center this year. I know there hasn't been a lot of attention always on the facility itself. I see some hands out here. Uh, we actually uh, replaced the air conditioning system in there because it blew up, um, and the roof because it was about to blow up. Uh, we are going to take a more proactive approach, though, on the, those kind of projects in the future. Uh, we began construction, as Barbara already mentioned, on the Health Professions and Athletic Center. Uh, and it has been a multi-year process. It took a lot of years to get here, and there's been a lot of folks that were involved in this, some of who are no longer with the college. And you know, it's, all of, it's taken a ton of folks to make this happen. Um, we can't do it alone. We, we appreciate everything that everybody's done. Uh, we expanded this year the TPAC program to offer some small venues. Uh, actually, we had three programs right up here on this stage that were well attended, uh, well received, and we're using that as a jumping off point for next year. So as we look at next year, what are we continuing? We're continuing the compensation study, which we already talked about. We'll be rolling that out. We'll continue construction to finish out the building. Believe it or not, we will be in that building this time next year. It's hard to believe. For some of us, it's a little scary. Um, but we will get there. We are continuing to enhance the Cambridge Center. Our next project is flooring that we'll be working on this year. Again, we're trying to, uh, you know, dress it up and be the quality of institution that reflects of our faculty and our students there. Uh, we're going to continue to expand the TPAC program. Uh, Linda was handing out programs. They weren't programs for the day. They were actually the TPAC program for the upcoming year. Other than the Beatles program that's on here and the BSO, these are all programs that are being offered this year by our staff. So a great expansion. The other thing to keep watching for, we're going to be doing season ticket sales this year. So look for your six-pack and T-pack for those that are adults. We're also going to do a children's season program. And we have a couple of programs where we're going to offer special pricing for our students to get our students in this theater. Because, again, that is a big part of what this is about. New initiatives that we're taking on. Uh, Phil Mertens, you, uh, all you should have seen in the email, has accepted a new role for us. We've got to take care of our facilities. We have almost a quarter million dollars in assets here. A quarter billion dollars in assets. $250 million. We've got to take care of them. That requires proactive planning. The first thing that Phil is doing is spending the next 90 to 120 days, I see Phil over here, is actually going through every one of these buildings and assessing not just the building itself, but the major subsystems, so the electrical, the HVAC, anything that could possibly go wrong in a building or wear out and tell us where we, what kind of condition they're in so that we can start planning on making sure that things run smoothly, that we have replacement funds for them um, so that we continue to operate. You know, we don't want another closure like we had last winter in the Cambridge Center. All right, we're going to, one of the other things that we're in the process of doing right now is bidding, and hopefully with approval of the board this month, building a solar uh, photovoltaic system. <laughs> we're, look, we're looking to put in place a two megawatt solar farm. All right, it'll be very visible. Six acres of, of ground mounted system out on 213 down there below the ball fields. And then the parking lot that's under construction, if approved, will actually be canopied the entire lot with solar panels. 
that will produce 40% of the electricity that the campus currently uses. Five, five years ago, uh, that's on top of the almost 20% reduction we've already received from folks here doing taking and doing sustainable and things like just turning off your lights. So within five years, we will have come up, cut our dependence on campus on fossil fuels by more than 50%. As Barbara mentioned, we're also refining the budget process. We're going to continue to find ways to further, you know, align our um, resources to meet the student needs. The other thing I didn't say about the solar system, it'll save us $100,000 a year, too. So that's money we can put to students and programs. Uh, we're going to uh, also, a couple more things, and I'm going to turn it over here. Uh, we're, we want to continue our commitment to our faculty and our staff. We're going to pilot test this year a career development program through HR. Uh, and Kate Maxwell is actually working with HR to help develop that program. I think she's already reached out to some of you. And then we're also going to develop a supervisor training curriculum this year. You know, we do a great job of teaching our students. We need to teach our staff as well. And that's something that we want to make sure that we do. Okay. Thank you all for that. Turn it over to Rich. It, it's really hard to follow $36 million buildings and solar power, <laughs> but I'm going to try. Uh, one of the things that uh, I know we've talked about institutionally over the last uh, two years at least is the enrollment situation. And enrollment is still declining. Enrollment around the state is still declining. I'm in charge of, for my affinity group for collecting uh, uh, college enrollment reports, and institutions are reporting six, eight, and ten percent declines uh, around the state. So, you know, it's an it's an issue for us, and we know it. But one of the things that I'm very proud of is the way that we've responded to it. About. Two years ago, uh, the executive staff sat down, and one of the things we said is we had to do things different with regard to enrollment. For one thing, we realized, just, just looking at the demographics, that it really wasn't about growing enrollment as much as it was stabilizing it, that we need to get through this, this kind of demographic crisis. One of the key problems is our high school populations are declining, and they are one of the biggest FTE generators that we have. But what we decided to do is that we had, had to do things differently. We were kind of siloed, and we needed to involve the entire institution. And one of the ways that we did that was through kind of a re-engineering of the enrollment management process. Well, we created a, a cross-divisional committee, including all divisions of the college. Uh, out, of, out of the old uh, academic uh, assessment council, we added enrollment management to that, that group's charge. And it was both. Uh, uh, exciting and uncomfortable, to be honest, because what you had is you had four different divisions, you had people bringing different perspectives, and you had to take the time in building the plan to consider everyone's perspective. So it took longer, there were some tense moments, but we came out with a better plan, and we came out with a plan that was an enrollment management plan that tried to put into uh, effect uh, all of the goals that were in the high-level planning document of the strategic plan. We also did it with a, a, a pretty amazing amount of detail, right down to uh, steps that we would take in each of the strategies and initiatives, and each of them had targets and outcomes for us to look at, timelines, responsible parties. This was not a plan that was meant to sit on the shelf. It was a plan that was meant to be implemented from day one. As a result, here are some of the success stories that we had during the uh, FY14. One of the things we tried to identify, and the group did a great job, I think, of doing this, was things that we could impact directly and immediately. You know, new academic programs take time to bring up. A lot of the other things that you might try to, uh, that you would expend big resources on, you would want studies to make sure that that was a proper direction. We wanted to identify some things that we knew we could grow. Dual enrollment was one of these, and for us, it, was, it wasn't just a win, it was a win-win, because not only do we gain enrollment through dual enrollment, but a dual enrollment student is twice as likely to come to Chesapeake as a high school graduate who did not do dual enrollment. 
So looking at enrollment down the line, we knew this would be a good investment. Last year, dual enrollment grew 33%. This year, it's grown another 17% on top of it. Next year will be the first year that those students who have done long-term academic plans with for Chesapeake will be graduating, and we're hoping that an even larger percentage of them will be coming here as a result. Uh, Another thing that we did is we tried to look as a group, the APAC group, at academic programs, new academic programs that we could add but would not require full-time staff. And in the very first year, we identified exercise science and sport management as two programs in which we could do that. And through the tremendous work of the faculty committees, we were able to get that program through in one year with exercise science courses running this fall and sports management courses to run in the spring. The other thing that we did that I think was different and innovative here was we were building articulation agreements with four-year schools while we were building the programs so that we already have signed two different uh, articulation agreements with Salisbury University in the field of exercise science. We've assigned articulation agreement with Wilmington University in sport management, and we're currently working with three other universities in two states on sports management articulation agreements so that we can show students the path from here to there and a four-year degree. We, we've also, we've expanded our career resources. We did a reorganization and student success to do that. We also uh, expanded access to sale. It's, it's one of our, our most successful, we had data going back eight years, most successful retention programs in, in, our, in, uh, in our division. Uh, it's for first uh, time students. It started out as for full time students. It's now down to students with seven load hours or more can uh, participate. So it's a, it's a key retention program and we're expanding access to that. We've also implemented long-term plans for new degree-seeking students. This was a mandate out of SB 740 that was passed in April of 13 and had to be implemented by July of 13. And uh, our, our advising area uh, did a great job, I think, in, uh, in getting that in place so that we were compliant without adding any new advisors. Most of my colleagues around the state, in fact, over half of the of the community colleges in Maryland added academic advisors in response to SB 740. We got it done with the same amount of staff. We've also developed uh, cross-divisionally uh, a number of new student uh, orientations. Uh, past the dual enrollment uh, orientation that faculty and staff developed together, a student athlete new student orientation and an online new student orientation that will come online in spring of 15 for all students. This was one of the uh, key initiatives that we thought was important if we were going to have students ready from day one to learn and to work towards completion. And we also moved in financial aid to prepackaging financial aid so that students could see uh, ahead of making a decision what their federal aid would be. Minnie and her staff are working on doing the same thing with state and institutional awards. This is a, a real inducement to enrollment if a student can, can, you know, we talk about the academic plans, but for many of them it's the financial plan that's just as important. Moving forward, all of those FY14 initiatives have to be, uh, th there are steps that have to still be taken. We know resources are an issue. We ask a lot of our staff, we ask a lot of our faculty, and we know that sometimes it's going to take longer to do what we want to do, but as, as Dr. Vinara said, that doesn't mean you don't set the goal. You just understand it's going to take longer to accomplish. Some of the major FY15 initiatives, and again, all these are almost everything we do is cross-divisional because it has to be, is uh, implementing the Eleusian student planning module that will include uh, expanded faculty advising with pilot groups of students this year, with hopefully full implementation next academic year. And we also want to uh, expand the number of articulation agreements, specific agreements for specific programs uh, so that students, again, can see the path from here to the four-year school of their choice. And we also want to look at uh, some strategies that might uh, differentiate Chesapeake from our competitors. One that we've talked about, uh, which I think would be highly innovative, uh, we also have to see how practical would be to tell a new full-time student coming in, if you commit to completing your degree in two years, we will not raise your tuition. 
as a, as a, as, as a parent of college-age students, that sounds really good. <laughs> you know, we, what we do need to do is study the, the finances of that. And we also want to identify or develop and market academic recruitment and retention programs for adult students. That's a, that's a market where we could really, uh, really improve our numbers. And we also want to support the Advancement Office in the development and implementation of their new marketing and branding efforts. Last thing I wanted to mention, and, and I've said it, but I just want to emphasize this, all of this has required cross-divisional partnerships, and we have to be willing to look at what works and what doesn't work. This isn't a people thing. This is a process thing or a program thing. And if we're going to be bold and we're going to try things, not everything is going to work. We also have to, across the board, respect everyone's contributions because every different division brings something different to the process and makes it a richer end result. Thank you. Morning again. Talk a little bit about continuing education. And I think we'd like to start with um, some of our fiscal year 14 success stories. Um, we launched efforts to offer a HVAC program in Caroline County at Colonel Richardson High School. Um, we began efforts to obtain approval for VA tuition benefit approval. Uh, that's not a benefit that's been available to continuing education students here. Um, in, in a lot of places around the country, it is now. Um, it's also important because in addition to uh, the benefit being available to the veteran, um, them, the veteran themselves, it, under the post 9-11 GI Bill, they can extend that uh, benefit to a spouse or a child. Um, so we're gonna pursue that with great vigor. Um, we delivered our first program at the Dorchester Career and Technology Center. Uh, I don't know if many, any of you have had an, ever had an opportunity to see that facility. It's beautiful, state of the art. Uh, we hope to expand our programming efforts there. Uh, we think there are a lot of people down there who would benefit from some of our programs, but it's a 60 mile round trip to get up to Y Mills. And quite frankly, they have some resources there that we don't have here. So we wanna continue to tap into that. Um, we successfully offered uh, our motorcycle rider training program during weekday hours, which the, on the surface that seems like, well, well, that's not a big deal, but, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You, 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 you couldn't read my mind? <laughs> okay. Um, because we historically have always offered the motorcycle training program uh, on, on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a great program. It, it, it's, it's, it generates obviously safer motorcycle riders. It also assists those students in receiving, receiving uh, dramatically decreased insurance uh, premiums. So um, we, we tried doing it during the weekdays and it's been quite successful. Um, we added a second um, session of our veterinary assistant program, which is probably one of our most popular programs. Um, oftentimes, even before our catalog hits the street, the class is, is sold out and it, we, we cap it at 25. So we tweaked the calendar and decided, figured out a way to fit two sessions in to one fiscal year and first session attracted 25 students and the uh, second session attracted 22 registrations, I believe. Um, and we successfully launched efforts to bring ESL programs into businesses on site at their locations. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with our adult basic ed program, ESL, GED. It's um, scattered all over the five counties. We have 25 different locations. Historically, they've been social service agencies, um, churches, uh, facilities like that. But we proactively went after businesses who, where we thought we might be able to provide assistance assistance and we're currently in the Hyatt down in Cambridge, the Holiday Inn over in Kent Island, and um, the third one, which uh, I can't remember, but. <laughs> okay, who do we serve? I'm gonna bring these all up at once because it just gives you a flavor of what goes on in continuing education. Um, we serve 
people from five to 95. Uh, through our Kids on Campus program, through our Early Childhood Development Center, we serve both children and those who serve children. Again, um, the Kids on Campus program is available during the summer. The uh, pro programs available to parents and those people who work with children are available throughout the year in all five counties. Uh, we offer a t actually a total of 14 different healthcare programs, six of them in a classroom format, eight more available online. Uh, our, one of our biggest customers, our business and industry and other organizations, nonprofit government agencies, and we do a lot of work with senior citizens. Um, at, at, again, taking the programs out to the counties and uh, delivering over 300 programs a year, seminars, lecture series, things like that at senior centers. In addition to that, we operate what's or we, a partner with a group called the Institute for Adult Learning. Um, it's kind of a self-governing entity of uh, people actually, they're not really senior citizens, they're over the age of 50, which would, um, it's a bit of a, I don't know. Um, but um, it's, what, it's one of our growing programs. So we, we really do cover the spectrum, and, and, and more importantly, so much of what we do with adult basic ed, GED, uh, uh, the Early Childhood Development Center, um, the senior programs is, are programs that we bring out to the five different counties. We all know about the geography of the Eastern Shore and how tough it is for people who, even if they may want to come to a program at Y Mills, just finds it difficult to do so. We, 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 our, our goal is to take as much as we can out into the community. And we ended up this fiscal year with an unduplicated headcount of about almost 7,800. So we're very happy with that number. It was, uh, I think, a record breaker, quite frankly. Okay, moving forward in FY15. We're going to expand our marketing to include radio, TV, and social media. We've, we've we're already using some social media, but we're, we, we, we really want to try and cover the bases on that. Um, so we'll see much more activity there. Um, we have to keep in mind always that, especially in targeting the business community, uh, we've got to constantly stay in front of people. There's a reason you see BMW commercials night after night after night. It's because you, you need that presence. We're not going to compete with BMW, but we're going to be a lot more visible than we have been in the past. Um, I mentioned the HVAC program. It's, we did have a successful rollout. Roll Classes will begin uh, the day after Labor Day. Uh, it was so successful, in fact, that the first class, which is scheduled to meet on Tuesday and Thursday evenings, filled up in about 48 hours. We added a second session. It will be offering on Monday and Wednesday evenings, so we're very, very pleased with that. Um, we're going to continue to work on launching a military to marine program in partnership with MEBA. Um, that's the Mariner Engineering Benevolent Association School. It's on St. Michael Road. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it or maybe some of you have been there for weddings or events like that. Um, but we're going to try and develop a program that they've pitched to us about attracting people who are leaving the Navy. Um, we're going to launch a dedicated marketing program to go or grow our contract training business. We've done, can, we've done a lot of that over the years. Um, we're going to get much more aggressive about going after it. We can do that on campus. We've done it at the Cambridge Center, or we take programs out to companies. Could be computer classes, leadership development, management, uh, communication skills programs. A whole runs the whole gamut of what we can offer. And um, we're going to pursue seeking approval for VA benefits for at least three of our certificate programs. And finally, we're going to expand programming available at all county high school vote tech centers. Um, people earlier talked about resources. Well, that HVAC program that we talked about at Colonel Richard said, we couldn't do that here. We don't have a, a HVAC lab. We don't have the equipment required. Colonel Richardson spent $250,000 on that lab. Um, there are a lot of other locations, in, in, um, I mentioned Dorchester, uh, locations that have access to uh, uh, facilities and labs that we can't have here, but if we can't have them, we can work with those schools to bring our programs in in the evening to target that adult student population after um, the traditional students have already left the campus. 
Future goals. Increase enrollments. Gee whiz, what a novel concept. Um, we do that two ways, and, we, and we're going to focus very hard on both. One is, is, is new programs, uh, um, like, the, uh, like the HVAC program, like the um, um, uh, community health worker program. Um, there's a variety of ways to do that. It, 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 if we identify a, a need in the marketplace, we will bring, uh, th build those programs and offer them to the community. Um, the second is through a, a, a much more um, aggressive marketing program is make sure that every one of the classes that we offer is full or almost full. We do, we, like everyone else, we run classes that maybe can seat or, or hold 15 people, but we run the class with 10 people. Our goal is to fill those other five seats. Add programs that present new employment career paths to our students. That's a big part of what, when you hear workforce training in our title, that's what it's all about. What kind of, what kind of programs can we offer that will lead people to be able to either join the workforce, change jobs, uh, launch a new career? And, and, and that's probably almost priority number one grow revenues. That goes hand in hand with increasing enrollment, but we are a rever revenue producing um, operation, so th that's the, a big part of what we try to accomplish. Um, continue to bring programs out into our community. That's, again, what we're, we're going to continue to build on what we've already offered. Cross-divisional partnering to grow the number of CE students transitioning to degree-seeking. You heard Rich talk about that. We're, we've already done a lot of that working with Rich's team, but it's, I, I think we, all, we both agree that what we can do is be much more strategic and, and much more organized about the way we approach it to make sure that those students that are CE students who are a part of the Chesapeake family make sure that they know what other opportunities are available to them so that we can turn those students from, move them from CE when, when, when it's appropriate, um, like through our CNA program, uh, into, into um, degree programs here on campus. And that's about it. Thank you very much. I'm going to reveal my inner Shakespeare geek here. Um, my message, summer is fleeting. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. This is for all of you. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease has all too short a day. Vacations and family gatherings are a fading memory. Where did the summer go? The days are already shorter. You've noticed that? It's, the sun is setting before 8 o'clock now. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none, or few do hang, upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Classes haven't even begun and I'm already tired. <laughs> where are the notes I made about those new assignments? But every year brings a fresh beginning. Happily, I think on thee, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. We'll see new students, young and old, some eager to learn, some terrified to fail. And we have great plans for the future. True hope is swift and flies with swallows' wings. We have seven new full-time faculty. Two new programs, actually we have more like four new programs starting this year. In addition to sports management and exercise science, we have landscape architecture, and, and what? Landscape management. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be doing really bold new things in our curriculum. 
we're looking at at least two more for next year. Vet tech and sustainable agriculture we're exploring. Uh, we have to build on Michael's success with, in the vet world, I think. And we're piloting a one-to-one -one iPad in nursing and education, and we're hoping to expand that to eventually bring a one-to-one -one iPad campus-wide, which is really exciting. The HPAC is rising from the ashes of the pool. <laughs> and we can overcome any obstacles. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Have a wonderful year. I realize I'm the last speaker between you and the keynote, which I'm sure you really want to hear, so I'm going to try to make this short and sweet. So good morning again and welcome. Um, let's see if I can do this. I usually don't chew gum and walk very well at the same time, so we're going to try this. Although I was only here for about a month in fiscal year 14, Lauren and Marcy made things happen in the offices. There was a continued successful AIG program, and that's thanks to you all. I've worked in many institutions, and I've never seen faculty staff giving at the levels that it is. So congratulations, and thank all of you for all of your support. <laughs> there was an enhanced push for communication, and um, we've got, we're pushing to get the name out there. Marcy continued to really work on that. And then we also, in FI14, began the quiet phase of the setting sail campaign. And I think most importantly, what happened in 14 to set us, to move us forward in 15, is the merging of the development and the public information offices to create the Office of Institutional Advancement. And the Institutional Advancement Office is really here to support you all. We're here to support the campaign. And when I sat down and worked with Marcy and with Lauren and with Barbara and talked about how we could do that, we came up with three areas that we're really going to focus on. We're going to communicate the college's values to the stakeholders. That is crucial. We have to, have to, have to raise awareness for this institution and all the fabulous things every one of you are doing at this college. We have to support advocacy. And we have to grow public and private su support. How are we going to do this? We're going to raise brand awareness, image, and profile among our key audiences or our stakeholders. As Rich talked about, we're going to work on the recruiting side of things. We're going to, develop, we're going to take the brand that we have and we're going to develop it and we're going to make it bigger, better, faster, stronger. We're going to have a comprehensive communication strategy. Constant, consistent communication to our valued stakeholders. We all have to be speaking from the same page when we're out there talking about Chesapeake but we have to tailor the messages to all of our stakeholders. We have to really push and tell these stories with the media. We have so many amazing things happening on this campus, among our faculty, among our staff, with our students. We've got to get out there and really, really, really shake the bell and, and bring people on to the excitement. And working in partnership with the technology department, we're going to refresh the website so that it's going to reflect the new branding and messaging. Enhancing advocacy. We have elections coming up in November. We're going to have all new elected officials from the governor down. We've got to get out there. We've got to introduce ourselves. We've got to make our case for support of Chesapeake from the governor's level all the way down. So we'll be spending a lot of time this fall out there doing that. And we've got to increase our presence in community organizations. Some of us are involved in Rotary, in Lions Club, in the different activities that are going on. We need to really bring that effort together and go out there as a full force so that the entire community sees us and sees what's going on. We have to raise additional revenues from both public and private support. And we're going to do that through an enhanced annual fund program, which is annual giving. These are donations that come in every year to the college. 
We're going to increase our foundation board. They're the fundraising board of this institution, and our goal is to add six new members to that this year, so it's pretty aggressive. We're going to take care of the donors we currently have. We're going to say thank you to them and make them feel special and make them feel that they're a part of this winning organization. And we're going to really work with our alums. As I've gone out and I've talked to people, I am blown away by how many people went here. And we don't talk about it. And we need to get it out there and we need to really, really make them feel proud of the fact that they went here. And that will really translate for us as them becoming the best ambassadors possible for this college. I'm really excited about the alumni part, as you can tell. We're also going to finish the setting sail campaign. Barbara talked about this um, in her remarks. It is a $3 million effort for us. It's a lot. Currently, we've raised about 600000 for that effort. We've got a lot of work to do in the next year. We're going to be continuing to identify potential donors, and I ask each and every one of you, if you think of someone that you think would like to support this or would like to know more about the college, come see me. Come see Lauren. Come see Marcy. Come see Barbara. Tell us who they are. We're happy to meet them. We're happy to introduce them to the college and get them excited about it also. We're also, we have a prospect pool that we're continuing to work with to solicit them for donations. And faculty and staff support. We're going to create ways for you all to be involved in the campaign if you wish to do that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. So what do you think of the new way of doing things? Okay. We, we thought it would be easier if I introduced these people because Lucy so knew she doesn't actually know who they are. Uh, many of you have just finished giving to our internal giving campaign, and now we face a difficult challenge of asking you to give again. Um, every time we go out to the community, they are so impressed by the level of giving among employees, none of whom make a lot of money here, none of whom are getting rich by working at Chesapeake College, and all of whom feel that they need to make the same investment we ask of people outside the college. So we're going to ask you to be part of the campaign at any level that feels appropriate to you, and you will soon be visited and talked to by your peers. And they are Dana Bowser, Crystal Farina, Vinnie Maruji, Laura Shahan, Deanna Stock, and Frank Szymanski. So I thank them all for being willing uh, to be out in front and to help us with this campaign. And they will be convening shortly and figuring out their strategy to talk to all of you. And now, I want to introduce a very special guest. Uh, some of you met him at our countdown to construction. And I want to say that when the Billicks decided to buy a house on the Eastern Shore, they did what we hope our students will do. They became citizens. They said, we live here. We love it here. What can we do to help? What can we contribute to the place where we live? And Brian Billick, and I, I know he doesn't need an introduction, but maybe we have some really new people who don't know that he is a winning Super Bowl coach and currently an NFL analyst. Uh, so we get to watch him all year and listen to him talk about football. And um, mostly he's a friend to Chesapeake College and just a really nice person, and probably the tallest person in this room. Uh, and has been already of his time and effort to help us convince others that we are the place they want to invest in for the future of the Eastern Shore. So it is really my pleasure to introduce the honorary chair of the Setting Sail campaign, Coach Brian Billick. Hi. I, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know I'm not one of the vice presidents because I'm not wearing a tie and I'm not introducing anybody. So, uh, but as Barbara said, I'm always thrilled anytime I can get up and be around peers. And if I can humbly and respectfully submit that, I do view it as a peer because I coached for over 30 years. And, and I will tell you, and I've written five books on the subject of coaching, teaching, and leadership because they're all interchangeable. That's exactly where you're at right now. In fact, 
I always do that. I Google those terms when I, uh, whenever I come and speak. Um, you, you Google leadership, you're going to get over 159 million references. You Google teaching, you get the same 150 million references. And I would challenge you to say, or challenge you that if you wanted to, you can go back and whatever those materials are, whatever that site takes you to, you juxtaposition any of those words, teaching, leading, coaching, and it doesn't change the meaning whatsoever. Now, my primary purpose up here is to, again, reiterate what, what uh, Lucy's talking about and Barbara, obviously, being a part of the Set Sail campaign. You've been very generous. That's a subtle way of saying we need more. And more importantly, what I want to offer to anybody in this room is uh, if there is any way that you think my presence might help, and we're talking primarily of a little bit more major donors, that whether it be corporate rise or whatever, if you think there's something I might be able to help with, that's my real purpose here. And you can, uh, via Barbara, feel free to contact me. I won't, I won't, you shouldn't be offended when I say no, and I won't be offended when you ask. So there is no task that you could bring forward that uh, notwithstanding my time, I wouldn't be happy to be a part of, because this is our community now. My wife Kim and I have moved here. I grew up in LA. I never thought in a million years I'd end up on the Eastern Shore, um, but we love it here. And the programs that you're doing are so impressive, and we do need to make sure that everybody knows about what's going on here. Now, what I want to share with you very quickly, because I can realize by Doug's uh, uh, approach, brief gets a better response, so I'll be as brief as I can. <laughs> And I always talk to my players of 30 years. I tend to be a little hyperkinetic, so you're going to have to listen fast. But I will tell you this. I want to share with you, if you will give me uh, the, the, the honor, uh, the, the respect uh, that I hope you do, that as a coach, I was a teacher for better than 30 years. Now, for the last six years, I've been out of that profession. I've been commentating. And I do a great deal of corporate speaking. I do about 30 gigs a year where I go around the country. And it's been fascinating to do that. One, to step back out of almost a sabbatical and, and going into a different facility of my competitors every week. Uh, what a great opportunity that's been. Uh, and to learn from it. If I were to go back into coaching, and I'm done, people always say, oh, well, would you go back and coach? And my stock answer is they're looking for young and cheap, and I'm neither. So no, I'm not going to go back into coaching. <laughs> but if I were, because of those two experiences for having the last six years sat in a different facility every year, and then also the corporate speaking, because when I go around to the corporations, what do they usually bring me in to do? Okay, it's a motivational, but team culture. How do we build this culture of team in this organization with, because what are they doing? They're either consolidating divisions or they're acquiring new companies. How do we bring a diverse group of people together into a singular team? And that's usually the themes that they want me to talk about. And it's fascinating to hear it from the business side because when it really comes down to it, you're on the cutting edge of that, of the workforce that's going into the workplace. And the number one, if I can share three things with you, if I can, from those cumulative experiences, because you are on the cutting edge of it. That, and my daughter's the head of HR for Abercrombie and & Fitch. And we're con there you go, that's right. Um, and my other daughter works for Under Armour, so we got it covered. To, if, I don't, if it's not Abercrombie & Fitch or Under Armour, I don't wear it, it's as simple as that. <laughs> but in talking to my daughter, it's the same things. And I know, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I, in fact, if I were to stand up here and give you the normal corporate spiel that I give, I'd be a little embarrassed because you'd go away going, well, no kidding. Because I know as teachers, as educators, you live it. I'm the same as the minister that got up and gave the sermon on the Ten Commandments because he had thought someone had stolen his bicycle. And when he got to thou shalt not steal, he'd look around, but then he got to thou shalt not commit adultery and he remembered where he left his bicycle. <laughs> so what we're doing today, one of the things I want to talk, the three things I want to point out are really a, by way of remembering where we left our bicycle, because I know you know these to be true. But they're very, very real. I'm talking about from the corporate perspective, something that you live every day. Number one comment that I get from the corporations and I hear from my daughter is the new workforce, the young people we have coming on our workforce, the new millennials, they're so enabled. They're so focused on, well, when's my first promotion and when do I get my first pay raise? As opposed to, yeah, it's one thing to learn the tricks of the trade, but you got to learn the trade first. We saw it last night in my field, in the NFL, Johnny Manziel and the Cleveland Browns. The, the whole, you know, where's mine? This guy hasn't played a snap in the NFL in the regular season, and it's already, I'm the best, where's mine? How do I get mine? And the new millennials coming in, if they can somehow grasp the idea that if they can move past that mentality and not be about them, that that's the best way to per personally promote yourself up through the ranks, 
Corporate leaders are looking for that individual that can buy into that concept. Sir, we understand that what's good for the individual has to be good for the corporation. But what's good for the corporation can be good for the individual. And if we can get them to grasp, it, grasp that, it's huge. And another aspect of it, and I can tell you we're living it right now as a coach in training camp, you're on the front line of it, is the biggest challenge I have with young players coming in in our training camp. Training camp usually, typically runs about three weeks. And the mentality of the young people coming in is, well, I just want to get through this. I just want to be able to check off the box, get through those three weeks. And my, one of my biggest jobs is saying, that's the wrong approach. you got to look at it as, what can I gain? What can I learn? How can I get better over the next three weeks? Yeah, it's arduous. Yeah, it's long. Yeah, it's tough. But if you're just trying to get through it, to check off the box, you're missing an opportunity to get better, particularly as a player, all but a short three weeks, and the same as a student. I know you see the same with the students. The big advantage you have here, as I see it, compared to maybe high school, where obviously a little bit of that, regrettably, in our educational system is just check off the box, get through that. Well, your students are here because they want to be here. They may not really appreciate why they're here. They may not appreciate the up end or where the course that that can put them on, but they, at least they have an idea that maybe this is the right thing to do. And now showing them that way in terms of not just checking off the box, using this as a foundation, and, and gaining those skills that you need or at the very least, maybe show you the opportunities for you going forward. And you are at the forefront of that. Now, the final thing I'll share with you, because, again, I know you, you, you've got things to go on. And I'm happy that I'm going to be around for a little bit. If, if you've got the time, love to answer your questions. I know probably have some Redskin fans. And based on last night, based on last night, you have a lot of questions. I can understand that. I don't know if I have the answers, but we can certainly try. But And it was very fitting that Doug put that apple 1984, now, I'm of that age where I remember that. Um, because Apple was really, and I talk about this from a corporate standpoint, but it carries over and exactly into what we're talking about in what you do and what you're about to embark on for this year in a very real life term. The big thing about Apple, uh, and, and, and when I saw this and I heard a gentleman talking about this and the concept, the psychological concept of buying, I was at a seminar and, and a gentleman got up, a sociologist who was brilliant in his presentation, and he referenced this, and it, it so, was so applicable to the things that I've learned as a coach, as a teacher, over my 30-plus years in doing this. But the thing with Apple was they grasped on the understanding that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Big thing that Apple hooked onto. Rather than saying, okay, we have a processing unit, and it does X, Y, and Z, so you should buy this. They sold a culture, a mindset of this is, this is where we are going. This is what you want to be. This is what you want to aspire to. And oh, by the way, we have a product that will help you do that. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it, which is so readily to me when it comes to teaching, coaching, and leadership, I will tell you people don't follow you because of what you say. They follow you because of why you say it. As a teacher, they're not just listening to what you're saying. They want to know is there passion with it. Because at the end of the day, also, they don't care what you know until you know that they care. Right? You combine those together. The students need to know that you care about them, that you have passion for what you're doing. That's why you're teaching it. I learned a long time ago, and I don't want to get too philosophical with it, but it's been in existence for centuries. And I learned, really didn't learn until I got out of coaching until I started doing a great deal of corporate speaking. And I learned in corporate speaking, anytime you stand out in front of a group and you want to talk about a concept, you're trying to present something. There's three fa phases of it. It goes back to the, the ethos, logos, and porthos. Credibility, content, and then basically passion for what you're talking about. And for centuries, they've equated that to a 20, 20, 60%. 20% is credibility. I'm a Super Bowl winning coach. So that's why people have me come into their corporations, because I have the, the credibility, OK? You hope the content is there that I can give them something that maybe they can build on. Same thing with your students. Obviously, you have the credibility. You're the teacher. You're certain content that you're going to give them. But in corporate speaking and in business and in presentation, they'll tell you that it's 60% in terms of the passion and the way you approach it. And that's basically what I'm coming back to when I say people don't follow you because of what you say. They follow you because of why you say it. And they don't care what you know until they know that you care. You combine those, and you know that. I know that. Holding on to that passion, one of the reasons I don't go back into coaching is because I have the self-realization of I don't know that if I were to go back into that grind 
And believe me, it is a grind, just like what you do is a grind. I appreciate that. I don't know that I could do that on a regular basis because right now I don't know where I am in my life that I have the, the constitution. I don't have the commitment in terms of the commitment of time and energy to step up to the plate every single day with the passion that you've got to with your students to show, yeah, it's the content you're going to give them, but to show that continual passion for what you're doing that will draw them into the tent, so to speak, give them that platform to understand why they're doing what they're doing, and you've got to do that almost on a connective student-by-student -student basis. It's harder, right? The, the old one-stop, my way or the highway, that was a lot easier. But in today's interconnective world where these students are used to dealing with direct interaction with any subject that they want, whether it be Apple TV or on their computer, that's what it takes to reach these students, what it takes to coach in the National Football League right now. The best coaches in the National Football League, I'll tell you, are not the ones that have the strategy or the tactics or what, because they're all doing the same thing. It's the one that connect with the players, very high profile workforce, each making, you know, these, you stand in front of 53 quasi-millionaires, that's a different room. And that's one that you better have. The difference between my players and your students is that my players will basically say, why should I listen to you? Your students are asking the same questions. They may be more respectful of it because you're the teacher and I'm not going to be that disrespectful. But the players, when you got a quasi-millionaire standing in front of you going, okay, why should I listen to you? How are you going to help me? And you know what? Those are fair questions and you better have an answer for that question. Certainly you've got the, the credibility. Certainly you have the content. You've got to hold on to that passion. Whatever it takes on that day-to-day -day basis to have that passion going into the classroom. I know it's not easy, but you've got to bore yourself up. You've got to help each other in that regard because that passion is truly what these students need to grasp onto, to go into the real world, the corporate world that I spend a great deal of time in right now. And I promise you, if they do that, they will have the keys to the kingdom. Thank you so much for letting me spend a few minutes with you.